share with you a psalm as we prepare ourselves for this time of worship. How well God likes those who don't walk in the ruts of those that are as blind as bats who don't stand with the good-for-nothings, who don't take their seats among the know-it-alls. How well God likes those who thrill to God's Word, who chew on Scripture day and night. Uh, you are a tree replanted in Eden, bearing fresh fruit every month, never dropping a leaf, always in blossom. You're not at all like the wicked, who are mere wind-blown dust, without defense in court, unfit company for innocent people. God will chart the road you take. The road they take leads to nowhere. And so, Father, we have just read the psalm, and uh, it speaks about how well God must like us. And then it mentions the things that you like. And so, Father, we ask that we may be found uh, thrilling in your word, chewing on scripture day and night, being like that tree that is replanted in Eden, um, bearing much fruit, um, being a shelter for those at times of storm, uh, for being an alternative uh, to the way of this world. And so, Father, for your wonderful gift of Scripture, for the wonderful gift of being the God that you are, for being the God who is always to reveal himself to this world, we give thanks. Thank you that your will, your purpose, uh, your guidance are not unknown as we walk our steps in this world. And so we give thanks for, be, for you being the type of God that you are. That out of love you continue to offer, you continue to initiate, you continue to start something new, you continue to begin to begin things in our lives. And all of this you do because of your great love for this world. And so, Father, may we be found learning to respond to your loving initiative uh, learning to reciprocate a little of the offer that you make to us. May we be found in relationship with you. May we be found in a growing relationship with you. And so, Father, we thank you as we look back on our own lives that we see this relationship uh, coming to bloom, that we are further along the road than we once were. And so we give thanks. Uh, for all the growth uh, that we have noted in our own living, for your guidance, for your protection, uh, for your call that gets clearer and clearer to each one of us. And so, Father, will you receive us today as your people, a people of worship? May we offer our worship to you and may it be a pleasing sound uh, to you. May we be your people by stilling our minds, stilling our hearts, and listening for your voice speaking into the very depths of our being. We thank you for this place. We thank you for the people of this place. We thank you for this hour of worship. We thank you that we are able to use this time a little differently to other days but to come together and to worship a great, a mighty, a loving, a gracious, a merciful, forgiving and powerful God. And so bless us into this time, we pray. Amen. Just to uh, share a little of the life of our church, first of all, the... Uh, Flower notice, um, grateful for 37 years of marriage, uh, grateful for all the lessons learnt, all the blessings received. 
Uh, together is our favorite place to be, uh, Tony and Cheryl. And so congratulations. <laughs> 37 years. Wonderful. So for the rest of the year of the Christian calendar, which uh, is different to uh, the calendar that we usually use, um, we will be following the lectionary readings uh, that are set for the church. The lectionary readings uh, are simply uh, readings that are um, given for a three-year cycle. And in those three years, the church ensures that uh, uh, the uh, Gospels are read in their entirety. And so uh, they are divided amongst those. So that's what we'll be doing through to uh, Advent, uh, which is the beginning of the Christian calendar, um, I think either the last Sunday of November or the first uh, Sunday of December, that we follow the lectionary readings. And uh, the epistle set for this Sunday is uh, from Hebrews chapter 4. And so we share it um, uh, as we consider the value of Scripture. And maybe you can answer that question a little bit just to kind of get a, a bit of a, a tag on where you currently sit and what the value of scripture is for you at this moment. Um, what is your practice? Uh, how closely uh, do you hold scripture to your living? Hebrews chapter 4, uh, reading from verse 12 through to verse 16. For the word of God is alive and active, it's sharper than a double-edged sword. In other words, it can penetrate deep. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. And as it penetrates deep, it is able to judge the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered, everything is laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. And therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne, the throne of grace. Let us approach that throne with confidence so that we may receive mercy, that we may find grace that will help us in every time of need. The Lord will always bless the hearing of his word. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, I'm not sure if it was because... Uh, the Methodist Church of Southern Africa just had their conference, but I thought I'd take you back to some Methodist stuff uh, today. Um, I will be reflecting a little on the mission statement of the Methodist Church of Southern Africa um, and just put it before you um, and reflect on the value of Scripture uh, using that. And so the mission statement of the Methodist Church of Southern Africa, um, it sets before us a vision of a Christ-healed and a Christ-transformed Africa. That's what it's calling us to be. Can we bring Christ's healing and Christ's transformation to our continent? Being reminded that the Methodist Church of Southern Africa operates in six of Africa's countries. It puts before us this vision of a Christ healed and a Christ transformed uh, province of Gauteng. Can this province know something of Christ's healing and of Christ's transformation? It puts before us a vision of a Christ-healed and a Christ-transformed Alberton. Can the residents of Alberton look back on the year and say, 
Christ has healed and Christ has transformed. And it puts before us a vision of a Christ healed and a Christ transformed Brackenhurst Methodist Church as well as a Christ healed and a Christ transformed community um, that Brackenhurst Methodist Church uh, forms. Is there a record of Christ's healing and transformation within our families over the last year? It brings to us a vision of a Christ healed and a Christ transformed individual that your story and my story includes mention of healing moments by Christ and transformations of being caused by Christ over this year. And so I'm wanting to hold up that vision before us again today as I ask a couple of questions. Are we becoming more and more Christ-healed and Christ-transformed people in order that when we proclaim healing and transformation through Jesus Christ, when we take that message to our families and to this community, when we share that message in our province uh, and in all the places that our work takes us to, when we share this message to our country and to our continent, Does that proclamation have a ring of authenticity to it? Is there some truth that is evident to all people which allows the power of the Holy Spirit to do its convicting work so that other people who engage with us saying there is healing and there is transformation for me because I've seen it in you. And so we need to be intentional and we need to be active in making the mission statement alive. Ours is the task to take the mission statement off of paper and to embody it, to make it alive. It's naive to think that healing and transformation through Christ will happen without us or independently of us. We've just been through a focus on the grace that is offered by God. And part of that grace was to know that the offer of grace is best responded to. In that to take an offer of love and not respond to it is just, it's sad. It's incomplete. It just flourishes when we add our response. And similarly, this offer of God's healing and transformation to our country, to our continent, to our families, it will require our response, our participation. There's a well-known statement that is made by Augustine that the God who created us without ourselves will not save us without ourselves. And so how are you, how am I being deliberate? How are you and I participating and cooperating in becoming people who can speak with some kind of integrity, authenticity, truth, people who can proclaim Christ's healing and transformation for all people because I am part of that. you and I will be exposed to Christ's healing and transformation in various ways. Um, but today I simply want to highlight uh, one way, and that is, can we become witnesses to healing and transformation? Can we become witnesses uh, through using the Bible? Uh, through our use of the Bible uh, and to allow Christ to work his healing and transformation in us as we engage with Scripture 
And so I really just want to highlight the Bible as a doorway that opens you and me to being healed and transformed by Jesus Christ. And so let me start with a statement and then I will try and elaborate on the statement. But you and I will be exposed to Christ's healing and transformation when the stories of Scripture, and particularly when the stories of the Gospel, are used as a way to norm our life experiences. And so we bring our life experiences to Scripture and we allow our life experiences to align with the story of the experiences of Scripture and the story of the Gospel. And so that will mean that we will test the basis of our experiences in life against Scripture just to see how our life experiences are measuring up to the experiences that are mentioned in Scripture Do the interactions with those with whom we live, does it measure up to the story that is told in Scripture? Do the acts of our days measure up to the story of Scripture? Does the way in which we conduct our everyday business, does it measure up to the story of Scripture? Does the way in which we use our sources, the way in which we use our assets, the way in which we use our money, does it measure up to the story of Scripture? Is Jesus participating in your spending? Is Jesus happy with what you're spending money on? There's the norming of it. Does our engagement with the poor does it tell anything about Scripture? Has the way we relate to others been soaked in the story of Scripture? Are the people who find themselves in our company at any given moment at the same time finding themselves being exposed to the story of Scripture so that if in case they haven't read Scripture, at least they've experienced Scripture through you and through me. Does our treatment of those with whom we are at odds, does it measure up to the story of Scripture, or do we choose a self-styled response to people that we disagree with? And so we need to use Scripture as a way of norming our Christian experience. And that means making a habit of interpreting and experiencing ourselves and our world in terms of the story of the people of God. What sense can we make of what we're going through by reflecting on the sense that others have made? of their experiences or similar experiences? Can we make a habit of interpreting and experiencing ourselves and our world in terms of the story of Jesus that we are told about in Scripture? And so when we begin to do this, when we begin to participate, when we begin to respond, God's offer is the revelation of Scripture. What are we going to do with it? We respond to it. And when we respond in this way, well then Scripture functions to mold and allow us to interpret ourselves and our world in conjunction with the Holy Spirit working within the text to enable us to hear and to receive a word of God that brings healing to us and to this world and a word that transforms you and me and this world. In speaking of the practice of solitude, which includes the reading of Scripture, Henry Nowen says that it is in this practice that we will hear God's voice calling us to open ourselves and to listen. 
And so he writes, in solitude, we can listen. It is possible to hear the voice of him who speaks to us before we could speak a word. It is possible to hear from him who healed us before we could make any gesture to, for help. It is possible to hear from him who set us free long before we could offer freedom to others. It's possible to hear from him who loved us long before we could give anyone love. And so solitude is where the other who directs our lives is revealed. The one who has plans for us. The one who wants happiness for us. And the one who wishes for the salvation of this world. I find those words very, very challenging. They say to me, Gavin, are you speaking into this world? Whenever you open your mouth in this world, are you maybe speaking before you have heard God speaking to you? If so, well then know that this world is only hearing all about you and life according to you. It's not hearing anything about God or it's hearing little about God and little about this world according to God. And in so doing, Gavin, you're selling the people that you engage with short. Your offer is light. It may be accommodating, it may be easy company. Your presence amongst others may even at some moments be entertaining. But your presence amongst others lacks God's power. And it lacks God's mercy and God's grace and God's freedom. And as a result, it lacks the offer of healing and transformation. And so Christ's transformation and healing will not be realized in this world without Scripture becoming a way of norming our life experiences. And so for the rest of this, service, uh, of this teaching, I really just want to uh, share with you two applications uh, of what we've heard. The first is that if we want, to, if we want Scripture to normalize our experiences, well then we will need to familiarize ourselves with the story of Scripture we just need to start reading Scripture. That's where it all begins. I remember speaking uh, to uh, a colleague of mine. He was a professor in English. Um, and uh, I spoke to him about how do I get my son, who is involved in all sorts of good things, but the one good thing he is not involved in is the reading of literature. You will not find this guy reading anything. And he says, Gavin, you find something that grabs his imagination. It doesn't matter what he reads. Just get him into the habit of reading. You can refine his reading later. But just get him into something that he enjoys doing while he's reading. And so the search began. But so many journeys just begin there. Just start the habit. Develop a habit. And the value of the habit will be cultivated afterwards. Now, I don't know about you, but as I look at South African society, and it's probably over the last 30 years, uh, there has been a real move away from uh, South, Afri South Africa become being, a, being biblically literate. Uh, that there's this massive move away from Scripture. I was watching a quiz show during the week 
And one of the questions uh, was a biblical question. And the question was, in which testament of the Bible will you find the person of Mary? And the contestant could not answer the question. Couldn't even guess. Didn't even know if there was an Old or a New Testament or if there were more than one or two Testaments. Just pass. Don't know the question. Don't know the answer to that question. But more disturbing than a biblically illiterate society is a biblically illiterate church. When you and I become biblically illiterate, well then we simply close the door on one of the primary ways in which God speaks healing and transformation into our lives and into this world. We also open up the door to being caught up by teachings which will take us further and further away from hearing God speaking his word into our lives. And so, church, are you? Are you reading the stories of scriptures? Is your family familiar with the stories of scripture? When they go to a quiz night, will they be able to answer a biblical question? As a church, we've always encouraged and supported the use of Scripture in this way. It makes up a large part of our public worship every Sunday. Not all churches use their time of worship in the way that we do. But I would say at 99% of our gatherings on a Sunday, we will devote most of its time to a scriptural passage and the proclamation of the word around that scriptural passage. And so simply by being present on a Sunday, those who gather on a Sunday in this church have the opportunity for scripture to norm their life experiences. It's available to everyone who attends this church. And so attending church regularly will make space for Scripture to be used by God uh, to bring healing and transformation into the lives of those who are here and also into this community. As a church, we also ensure the availability of daily devotionals through um, the issuing of uh, a little book called The Faith for Daily Living. And so we uh, source those and we make them available uh, to people so that if you are wanting to open yourself to being Christ healed and Christ transformed uh, through Christ's word, uh, you can do that. Uh, you can enter into a daily practice of reading a bit and the faithful daily living will choose a passage and will just reflect a little on it. And in so doing, you expose yourself on a daily basis to this norming effect of Scripture, and you bring your life into the presence of God's healing and God's tr transformation. And so those are available through the church office, um, I do see that there aren't any at the, on the desk at the moment, but sometimes they are at the back desk. But uh, you can get hold of them uh, by just contacting the church. There are other resources, but we will always encourage the daily reading of Scripture. And we will support you in that, because it's a known fact. That experience alone opens you to healing and to transformation. And I know and you know the healing and the transformation that is required in our beings. 
And I know and you know the healing and the transformation that is required in our society. Another practice within the church is that we commit ourselves to the study of Scripture through um, Bible studies that meet weekly. And I remember a statement by a biblical scholar uh, that said anybody who reads Scripture and is not confused at least 70% of the time has not seriously been reading Scripture. Huh? The Bible is not simple literature. It was written a long time ago in a foreign language which has been translated. There have been edits, redactions, additions, all sorts of things that we need to be aware of. It has a depth that is beyond great minds. And so as I reflect on my own journey with Scripture, it's no uh, surprise that my son didn't read anything. I didn't read my set works for my trick. Uh, he took after his dad. But I began to read Scripture in 1984. That led me to formal studies of Scripture for three years in 1987 to 1989. It led me into formal scriptures, uh, study in 1991. Um, since then, I've continued to be part of a Bible study. I've done private reading. Um, and with this history behind me over the last 40 years, I can only agree with that scholar who made the remark about how confusing the Bible can be. We cannot come to an understanding of Scripture without some kind of formal study or training. And so could I encourage each one of you to be deliberate in your study of Scripture. It will increasingly put you in the way of God's healing and God's transformation. Currently, I'm part of a Bible study that meets on a Wednesday morning. Um, I took it over from Fawn, and I was told that uh, we are doing the Gospel of Mark. And uh, we began there, and uh, we have made progress. But then we got to Mark chapter 13. It's got 37 verses, and our first read was a little bit of, uh, not 70, but 100% confusion. And it's taken us seven weeks to do 37 verses, and I'm not sure if we are much clearer, but we are a little clearer but there is an immense amount of work that is needed to understand Scripture. I've been married for a long time. <laughs> I have to work it out, 28 years. Um, it takes me a long time. It takes me more than 28 years to understand somebody else. And so there are just some pursuits that you have to commit to long-term study. And hopefully we will understand more and more of the object of our study over time. And so as I draw uh, this time to an end, it would be fitting me, for me to refer back to the scriptures that we read. And so we start with Hebrews chapter 4. And will you receive the encouragement where it says to us, just give God opportunity to make his word alive and active in your own living for it to be a tool, for it to be a sword, and for it to be the kind of sword that is sharper than a double-edged sword. May the Word of God penetrate deeply into your life and into mine. May it be found 
deep, cutting deep into our heart, judging and guarding our thoughts and our attitudes. May it unearth any hidden recesses that are resistant to God's kingdom. Little pockets which we keep. God, don't come here. This is my, my, this is my, what do you call it? Those rooms at the bottom of the house. This is my, this is my basement, my cellar. Uh, this is my zone. Don't come in. May it unearth hidden darkness. May it bring all of your life into the light of God. May it lay bare all of your life. And remember that judgment and guidance is from a great high priest, Jesus Christ, who is able to empathize with human weakness. He's able to know of every human temptation, but he is also able to know of how to come, how to overcome every te human temptation. Psalm 1 gives us that beautiful image of a person who meditates on Scripture and lives by Scripture to the one who has made God's Word alive. We focused on Psalm 1 in our sermon series um, where we looked at a few psalms. But this image is of a tree that drinks from an underground spring. And I think that there are people in your world, there's certainly people in my world, that are desperate for this kind of a tree. People who are deeply rooted. People who bear fruit over and over and over again. People who are able to give sanctuary and shelter to those who are experiencing a harshness in life. People who are able to stand firm when the wind blows. There are people deeply in need of Christ's healing. Deeply in need of Christ's transformation. And so may we at Brackenhurst Methodist Church May we be a people who give God access to our lives. May we give him access through a regular reading, through a regular studying of, of his word. May we be a people in whom Christ's word is alive amongst us. It's something that we can say, this is part of how we engage with each other around God's word. May we say that we are a people who, after engaging in God's word, take God's word and share it through us into this world to make it alive for others. May we be a Christ-healed and a Christ-transformed people. Just as we put ourselves in the way of God's word, hearing it in public worship, and saying, you know what, I don't do a great job reading scripture myself. Let me rely on other people reading it for me and with me. And at least on a weekly basis I can do that. But may we also not give up on reading it in daily devotions and in studying it uh, privately and in groups. I hope, I hope that scripture can be valued uh, more and more by you and me. I know that my investment into scripture um, has been of tremendous benefit. Uh, I must probably need to invest in it more. I would be a better person if I gave a greater investment to it. And I'm sure that's the truth for you as well. But may we be a people who value Scripture. Amen. Amen. We pray together.
Father, we thank you for this uh, wonderful opportunity that you give to each one of us through access to your scriptures. That words that were written long ago may become alive, may become infused with uh, the power and with the reality of your kingdom and given to us through your Holy Spirit. And so, Father, for this great revelation of yours, for this great offer of grace and mercy, for this great offer of love, we ask that we may respond appropriately. And so we thank you for all the ways in which we have been able to respond. But we know that our response remains incomplete. And so, Father, we thank you for this moment where we are able to respond to your word and we ask that we may continue in all our tomorrows to just seek the value of Scripture, normalizing our lives and allowing our lives to become a vessel for your healing and for your transformation, not just of our lives, but indeed for our continent and for our world. And so bless us and keep us as we seek to be your faithful witnesses here on earth. Amen. Amen. the Lord mighty God bless and keep you forever give you peace perfect peace strength for every endeavor lift your